Hello, my name is Grant King, and we are now in lesson number eight of the Letters to the Churches of Revelation. I apologize that it's taken me this long to be able to get this done. I had some things come up, and it just sort of uh, slipped out of the way. Or, uh, anyway, so we're going to go ahead and uh, do the last letter here, and that should complete the series. Not sure exactly what I'm going to do next, or uh, if, well, you never know from one day to the next what, what's going to be happening, so... We're still working on some future projects. So this is going to be the, the church in Laodicea. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for these uh, words we're about to read. Thank you that you've preserved this, uh, this scriptures for us and that you made sure that it was copied and that it was translated so that we would be able to read it. And as you said, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We thank you that you made it possible that we can hear what the Spirit has said to the churches. So guide us and uh, speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Okay, we're in chapter uh, 3 of Revelation, and this beginning in verse 14. Now this is the church at Laodicea. So here, we'll just read it first. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, this is a church. He describes this church as being lukewarm. Um... One of the things when you're thinking about lukewarm, a lot of times we think of the difference between hot and cold, and we think of something hot to the point that you basically can't either, well, let's just use the example of water. When we think of really cold water, we think of water that might come out of the refrigerator, and uh, hot would be water that either came out of the faucet with it completely turned on hot, you know, basically to the point where it was actually painful to touch it. Um, keep in mind that in this particular time period, they didn't have refrigeration, didn't have ice. So cold would have probably, let's just use the example of cold water, was probably what you would find in the Sea of Galilee or the Jordan River. It was basically just cold. So to get lukewarm would not have necessarily meant just the water that was sitting in a jar. It would have meant water that had been mixed, cold water that had been mixed with hot water. Now, I want to make a comparison here, just to give a bit of a comparison. So what he's talking about is he's talking about mixing two, cold and hot, to get lukewarm. Give me an example here from the Old Testament. Uh, let's look at, we'll take a look at real quick at uh, 1 Kings 18.21. Now, this is the big showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal and Asherah. And he's asking the question to the people of Israel. He went before the, it says, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. So what was happening here was you had the pro, you had Baal worship, and we find out later that God said that there were actually 7,000 prophets, who people who had not bowed the knee to Baal. But then you had the general population of Israel who was just kind of floating along, like, well, yeah, worship God, worship Baal, whatever. They were wavering between the two opinions. That would be a picture of what lukewarm is. And so it's basically um, mixing the worship of one true God with paganism. Now here's the thing here. It's interesting he said, I wish you were one or the other. That's interesting because let's say cold, let's say hot represents the true worship of God and cold is complete paganism. He said he'd rather you be one of those two rather than lukewarm. And here's a reason for it. If a person was 100% worshiping God, obviously that's commendable. Um, that would be hot. 
If a person is 100% pagan, they know they aren't worshiping God, and it's actually easier to talk to such a pagan. That would be cold. But here's lukewarm. The person who is mixing the two believes they are worshiping God and aren't even open to correction or a true presentation of the gospel. And let's look back at uh, <clears throat> the passage in, in uh, Revelation. This is, this is the way a lukewarm look, person looks at themselves. I am rich. This is beginning verse 17. I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. They think they're good. They think everything's fine. And, do, and here's the thing is, is it's spiritual blindness. They don't realize the situation they're in, that they are actually wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And he says to them, I counsel you to buy from you gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness. In other words, these people had no idea what kind of condition they were really in spiritually. And the thing is, is the sad thing about it is that we have actually, in the modern church, we kind of... Uh, We've kind of uh, encouraged that by what I call what has been sometimes called decisionism, to where we don't even really present the gospel. We just simply say, you know, if you need, if you, a lot of times a gospel presentation will be thing saying Jesus wants to heal your brokenness. He wants to bring fulfillment to your life. Uh, who wants to Who wants to give their heart to Jesus? Well, yeah, they don't. They, but they don't ever talk about things like repentance and the wretched state of the sinner, and. Uh, and the, basically, you end up with you end up with people who really aren't who think they're saved and really probably aren't. Lukewarm manifested in the man, modern church by adopting worldly ideas and bringing into them into the church, and we see that especially true with growth church growth strategies. And we also see it a lot of times with the counseling. A lot of times, we rely more on psychology for counseling than we actually do on the Word of God. Almost all the church growth strategies come from the social sciences, not the Bible. Now keep in mind, God gave us only two ways to grow a church. One, preach the gospel. Two, make disciples of those he saved. And keep in mind that getting people saved is not our job. That is a job that can only be accomplished by the Holy Spirit. But we basically make it a gospel invitation that, well, anybody would, have, would I mean, the truth of the matter is, uh, people who are just as carnal as the day is long want to have a better life. And so the thing is, we've made it, made it really easy to bring people into the church that aren't really being converted, that aren't really truly being convicted of their sin, their sinful nature, and their need of a Savior. And a lot of times people think they need to be saved from their problems. And, well, everybody wants to be saved from their problems. So the thing, now here's something he says here in, this is in verse 19. He says to, who, those, well, let, let's back up. Actually, let's go down because I want to make a point here. This is deviating from what I said before. Uh, in verse 20, it says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Now that is a lot of times used in an evangelistic message. That Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart if you'll just open your heart up to him. Okay, a little bit of context here is, remember, he's not addressing this to the unsaved world. He's addressing this to a church that has gone wayward. And the verse right before it, 19, says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And then he says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This is talking to a church that has lost their way, and he's calling them to repent. And that's who he's standing at the door and knocking. Now that as we get to Revelation 21 again, we come to the two things. There's a unique promise to the victorious ones there, and then there's the general one. There's the general word to all the churches. Specifically to this one, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. And then the last verse in there again, which the line that's in every single one of the uh, letter individual notes, he who has ears to let him hear what the spirit says to let him hear what the, did I read that right? Hang on, let me try it again. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So again, it's not just to Laodicea. This is a message to the entire church. So if you were capable of hearing this message, this message is for you. So that concludes the uh, the series that I did on the uh, seven churches 
are the seven letters to the seven churches. And I hope it was uh, good for you and that it was uplifting and that it benefited you and that it'll help you in your spiritual journey. God bless you.